So with that, I'd like to begin our first chapter looking at evolution and ecology in California in particular and how those have shaped um, the place that we call home. So California Floristic Province is a term we use to describe this area between Baja California and Coos Bay, Oregon, and then bounded to the west by the Pacific Ocean and to the east by the Great Basin. And in many ways, this designation, it closely aligns with um, our geopolitical borders of California, but it's been carved up, uh, particularly informed by um, the mountainous regions that border this area. So the Klamath Siskiyou to the north, uh, transverse to the south and the White Mountains, as well as uh, the Sierra Nevada that form that backbone, and then also the Pacific Ocean. So in many ways, we have this space that is an island from the rest of the North American continent. And in fact, if you look back to early historical records of Spaniards when they first showed up in California, they thought of this space actually as an island, and that was where California got its name. But in thinking about this isolation from the rest of the continent, uh, it's important to recognize that because of these buffers, um, we have distinct evolutionary history. So trends that existed throughout the rest of the continent maybe didn't always end up in California. And also having temperate climate moderated by the Pacific Ocean, as well as large mountain regions that block some of glaciation during the last glacial maxima have helped to protect these spaces and again affect unique uh, evolutionary and also ecological history. So in places such as the far northern part of California, we see refugia of plants that used to extend across much of the, of the Western hemisphere, things like various conifer species that are now contained what we call paleoendemics to those northern regions. And in places like the Bay Area, where I'm talking to you from today, and also further south in California along the coast, you find this wellspring of other native diversity that's emerged and is novel to California, things that we call a uh, neo-endemic, newly emerged. So all of these attributes really help to define and create something that is common amongst the California Philistic province in that deeper history. But of course, we also have a great variety of ecosystems that we find within this state, within this floristic province. And that's also something that we have to reconcile. So I wanna give an example of that. Not too long ago, I took a hike on Mount Tao Pius, which if you're not familiar with the Bay Area is a prominent peak just north of San Francisco, that's San Francisco in the distance as seen from Mount Tam. And what you find is that in view from Mount Tam, looking south, you can see just in the foreground, redwood forest. And of course, those redwood forests are including species that extend all the way up to uh, the Olympic Peninsula and even into Southern Alaska. And those redwood trees nourished by the coastal fog that, that comes in every day. But you can also find more classic uh, California Bay Area ecosystems such as oak woodlands, which are defined by these more drought tolerant species living just in close proximity. We can also look just from this one vantage and see grassland systems that abound and have a rich diversity of um, ephemeral species and wildflowers upon which so many of our native species depend. And then looking a bit to the north and to the east, you can see in drier areas, hard chaparral, again, such a contrast to those redwood forests and even also those those bay stands in terms of their composition and their um, stature. And then looking a bit to the north from this peak, you can also see in only a few miles distance, um, serpentine habitat, serpentine being our state rock that informs a really toxic habitat in terms of the chemistry of the soil in which very few things can grow. And here's a unique cypress that's able to grow in that habitat. And then surrounding much of this space as well, um, a really common landscape feature of the central coast, which is coastal shrub and coastal chaparral, which includes things like, like this sagebrush and um, this monkey flower. And then of course, looking further afield, you can see close off the coast, uh, the remnant of an extinct plate, the Farallon plate in the form of the Farallon Islands. And then looking to the east, the time of year that I went, you could still make out the snow-capped peaks of the Sierras. And with that, a diversity of other ecosystems, gradients of alpine, subalpine, mixed conifer forests. So all of that just within 150 miles of where I was standing. So in thinking about these different ecosystems and how they're able to exist in very close proximity, as well as those common uh, deeper time uh, characteristics that have given rise to the diversity that we see in California, we really need to think about what exactly are describing these patterns and what is the um, ecological history there. And here we can see California as shown from space 
And again, you can really see that kind of tailbone shape from the Sierra Nevada uh, that kind of winds its way down towards um, where the uh, the Channel Islands uh, tow into um, the Los Angeles Santa Barbara region. And then also those mountainous regions to the north. So let's start with defining ecology. And ecology is essentially a study of our home, planet Earth, oikos and logia, deriving from Greek words meaning household or family, and then logia being study or knowledge of some place. And this term was um, defined and first uh, categorized by uh, a guy by the name of Ernst Haeckel. Haeckel was a German biologist. He came up with the idea of ecology along with other botanists working in um, Germany in 1866. Haeckel, as it turns out, while often considered to be the father of ecology, isn't someone we should be putting on a pedestal. He espoused a lot of really controversial ideas, even for the time, including eugenics. But I bring up Haeckel because he was also, in addition to being a scientist, an artist. And this is an example of his work. He drew the beautiful, the bizarre, all sorts of incredible uh, life that he found. And it's still very popular today. You see on Hallmark cards, you see it in tattoo parlors. Um, it's really something that still captivates people's imagination. But I bring him up because I think that as an artist, he was well disposed to identify the need for this field. So before ecology kind of came to the fore, biologists and botanists tended to think about the world in ways of categorizing and cataloging those species that they saw, putting them into little boxes. I think there's a, a human uh, just, uh, prickly kind of go about and do that. And with ecology, we're starting to look at the disparate differences and bring those together and desegregate those interactions. So just as an artist may look for spatial relationship and geometry and juxtaposition, um, so too is the ecologist. We might look at something up close and it appears to be haphazard and muted and unintelligible, just a jumble of colors. But through a lens of ecology, we can have the perspective that allows us to start to recognize patterns and relationships. And so in this case, uh, the artist William Wentz, who lived in California, he used canvas and paint to render that landscape. When we think about ecosystems, the ways in which ecosystems are rendered is of course through a combination of physical and living attributes in our systems. We refer to these as being biotic, so biotic being those living elements, and then abiotic, which are those non-living components of a system. And how we bring those two components together and how those um, forces, particularly the resources that our living elements will rely on are provided and doled out within a system will tell us a lot about where specific organisms can live and grow and thrive in the communities, in other words, collections of organisms that will be able to flourish in different spaces. So I think that um, a good place to start then would be to think about this idea of niche. And essentially niche is the pairing of a species and its particular proclivities for habitat with environmental parameters. So again, those resources, that the species will need to live and thrive, but also the exact conditions with which those resources are available in that system. And I think that when we say something like niche as being a species role um, or a certain fitness to an environment, that can sometimes lead folks to think that we're describing something that is set or preordained, but niche is not. It's constantly adapting and evolving. I think one of the issues though, is many of us either don't have opportunity to see a system as it changes across time, or if we are witnessing a change across time, we may not be cataloging it, logging it. So our baseline may shift as that system uh, changes. So I think a way to think about this in a more human uh, dimension and time scale is if you think about if you've ever inhabited um, some crowd, maybe uh, at a concert or Costco after payday, and you have an idea of what it's like to be in a space where there's constantly changing parameters and inputs and variables that are affecting how you interact in that space and how everyone else interacts in that space. Uh, and so that's kind of an analogy that I'd like to use to kind of let us think about niche and to start to get our toes wet in this idea of species interactions. So let's take a peek at a crowd. This is a crowd in Golden Gate Park at um, Hardly Strictly, which is a concert every summer. I think it's a bluegrass concert. I go every now and again, even though I'm not much of a bluegrass fan, just because it is free. So let's imagine that we went to this concert in Golden Gate Park. And if we showed up um, to that park and there was all these songs of people, and we want to have a good view of the stage, we might have to kind of push our way to a place where we would have a good vantage of the performers, right? And so if you were to engage in that sort of interaction in this space, you'd essentially be in what we call competition with everyone else who's present for access to view of the stage. And so in ecology, that competition 
we describe as them being between organisms of either the same species or organisms of different species vying for access to a common resource. So most of the times, if you're at a concert or you're at Costco trying to get to the bulk bin, um, you're not going to be kind of punching people or shoving people, right? That's something we would call direct competition. Instead, you're just trying to sort of reposition yourself in such a way that you're able to minimize stepping on each other's toes and bruising each other's elbows, right? So that's what we refer to as an indirect competition. In nature uh, and in ecology, uh, how we think about competition, it's a bit of a pro-socialist stance in the sense that we see competition as ultimately having a negative impact on the individual. And that's because whenever there's competition that takes place, that means there's less resources for the individual and also in access of that resource, there's going to be more um, opportunity for um, threat to the ability to reproduce or to grow because of how those resources need to be accessed and acquired or protected. So just like in a crowd, everyone's trying to minimize their impact on each other. In the same way, natural selection and other selective forces, including behavioral patterns, help to minimize the impact that each individual and species have on one another in that space. And that allows for us to maximize how much utilization of that resource takes place in a system. And so this in one way helps to describe how we can see uh, the burgeoning of diversity that may exist in a certain habitat and the diversification of niche, or in other words, role in a system. And you can of course think that competition might be one way that we might access this resource, but maybe instead you're the kind of person who likes to dance, or maybe you came to picnic, you came to picnic, maybe you're very far at the back of this field and your engagement with this resource is gonna look very different. Or if you're dancing, it's always fun to dance with other people, right? So instead you may be in a situation where uh, rather than competition with others for access to a resource, instead you're in uh, a mutually beneficial interaction where by being around other organisms or being around other people in this case, uh, you're having an accentuated experience and accentuated appreciation and access to that resource. So to extend this then to the landscape, we should also think about um, what we're talking about in terms of uh, how this will affect where you can position yourself with respect to the resource. So in theory, you could have been anywhere in that crowd and have enjoyed the, uh, the band, right? But in actuality, there's other people that are there and there may be places where it's more uh, in line with your specific needs. And so we refer to these differences as being a fundamental niche, in other words, where you could be in that ecosystem versus a realized niche, which is going to be what is available to you after all the other resources have been um, partitioned up amongst those different species. And again, in thinking about this idea of um, all of these organisms through natural selection, through unwitting processes, but also through behavior, partitioning these resources, again, we're allowed to and able to see maximization of the uses of those resources. And in a sense, we see then kind of segregation in terms of ecosystem types. So we might look at this landscape and see that we have areas that are patches of grassland system, patches of low growing shrub, patches of forest. And there's going to be, because of realized niche, uh, segregation based on these community types. So these specific clumpings of organisms that have a proclivity to work well together. We also need to think though about density of our, of our system. So you can imagine that going back to our analogy of being in a, at a concert, you know, you can dance, say, at that concert, but at a certain point, if we pack that field too tight, there may be no room for you to move your arms and flail yourself about, right? And so certain activities may be limited by density. Here's an example of a post-fire regeneration forest um, that's dominated by Pinus contortus, that's lodgepole pine. These pines grow in so thick and dense that few other species are able to colonize that habitat because they effectively shade out those other species. So density can be an important driver in what will be present in our landscape and what will not be able to um, exist and thrive and find a niche within a system. And then we can also think about things that are not going to be density dependent. So whereas light or spatial area may be limited in this Pinus contorta stand, we can imagine that access to atmosphere, that's never going to change no matter how many trees we put in this space. There's always going to be available atmosphere for gas exchange. So I want us to round out this section by thinking about a concept known as species area curve. And species area curve effectively thinks of how the number of species found within a space varies as we increase the area that we're looking, that we're surveying. And so 
this is important to think about because I mentioned earlier that California is a very diverse landscape. Uh, we have many different ecosystems, but the Floristic Province is also incredibly large. So that leads to one idea that perhaps the reason we see such diversity, um, in fact, almost 6,700 species in California, is just a product of it being so massive. And in fact, what we find is that within a certain uh, habitat type, eventually the number of species that we can add to that system begin to plateau. So let's take a peek at that by looking at this picture of this weedy lawn, and this is something you're interested in. You can reproduce this very easily in your own lawn, assuming you haven't been too fastidious about, about your weeding. So I just pulled this picture offline, uh, and let's see what happens as we change uh, the uh, area that we're looking at. So to start out with, we'll have this small little survey sample of our landscape, and I'm gonna say this is some sort of remix again, I haven't been to this habitat, so I don't know exactly what it is, but we'll say it's a remix. So we have one species in this small area. Now let's multiply that area by four and see what we get. So we've got a remix, and now we've also got added onto that something else, which looks like it might be a, a buttercup, some ranunculaceae. And then let's do that same thing again. Now we've got the remix buttercup, and we've also got this grass that's tipping in from the top. Let's do that one more time. And now we've got all those four species again. And we've also got uh, some sort of little syncofoil thing up here. So we'll say that we had four species across that spread. So in looking at this, we can see that our species count went from zero to four. So zero, which was when we had no area represented, but our area has changed in a very different way. Um, and again, this is just a, a simple demonstration of how species area curve could work. But when we plot that out, we can see that within that habitat that we're looking at, we have this plateauing effect. And if we were to keep going, eventually we would have a flat line. And so as we increase area, we allow for more habitat, more area for different organisms to be able to colonize and grow and thrive. But also there's gonna be limitations to the textural aspects, the heterogeneity of that landscape. So while California may be very large, we also have to recognize that California has a lot of textural variety, a lot of landscape heterogeneity. And because of that, we're able to see that uh, that landscape provides for many, many disparate types of organisms to grow and thrive and to carve away for themselves a niche. And so if you compare a place like Texas to California, Texas, a much larger state, there's about 5,000 native plants. Alaska has about 2,000 native plants. These are massive areas. California, our third largest state, and you can find uh, 6,700 uh, plants. So again, that speaks to just a lot of the incredible diversity that we see in our landscape. Um, and just to wrap things up, as we think about uh, California moving forward in this class, we're gonna wanna think about all of the different uh, unique ecosystem attributes that will provide for our plants and the traits that our plants bring to the equation that allow them to have, uh, uh, to inhabit um, those spaces that we find them growing. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to uh, questions.